and have you out here by two. I know it's freezing too, that's why I have this sweater. So anyway, welcome to the session. Again, this is a session on focused on blended learning. And uh, my name is Judy Perez. I, I, I think my bio is, is in the information uh, pamphlet there. Uh, but uh, I, I retitled this because I wanted everyone to keep in mind during the session that blended learning really is more about innovation and, and kind of a means to a goal. And so uh, that goal being personalized learning, using project-based learning models in your blended learning and in personalized learning. So, so that's why I, I changed it up a little bit. But the focus during the session will be in blended learning and how to use open education resources to uh, support implementation. So just real quick background, uh, really in online education when it started about 15, 14 years ago in K-12 ed. Um, but I've been a, I'm, I'm an educator, I've been doing that for about 25 years, uh, teaching science in middle school to principal to a, a director of e-learning in a, in a very large district in Colorado and uh, worked for the Colorado Department of Ed for about a year, helping them understand kind of e-learning a little bit more. And then now I run a nonprofit, so I kind of left formal education even though I, st I still consider it my space. Um, and, and these two guys are the reason why I kind of got into e-learning. It wasn't called blended learning way back when. Um, they're not little anymore, but I, I really approached the work as a parent first and then as an educator. So uh, what, what we offer in blended learning and the reason why I have a passion for this and the reason why I think every student should have access to blended learning instructional models is because it's really about access and equity uh, for students who live in any part of the United States, no matter socioeconomic status or the size of their district, they should have access to innovative instruction um, that also engages them and then allows them to use technology for learning and not just you know, using it for other purposes, uh, especially when they're getting instruction from, from um, the, uh, the learning. And so uh, we also are a consortium. We don't do this alone. We work with many school districts in Colorado alone. We are now positioned to work with 185 school districts to implement blended learning at scale. And uh, we also work with other organizations across the United States, other nonprofit organizations, other departments of ed, and other for-profit organizations who support quality blended learning. And before I go any further, if, if I can get a show of hands, how many teachers do I have in the room? Okay, excellent. And then how many district leaders in the room? And school leaders. Okay, uh, so it's a really, it's a, it's a pretty fair mix of folks. So I will continue with the way this is uh, created. I was going to customize it a little bit, but I think it'll apply for, for everyone. Uh, okay, so uh, part of the reason why we are doing what we're doing or why we actually uh, felt like we needed to implement blended learning into our schools in our districts uh, is because uh, we have had many issues facing us for many, many years. These issues are not new. They're across the board, uh, all over the nation. Um, nothing that is surprising here. Um, I'd say within the last decade, decade and a half, we've kind of had more of this issue here uh, than, than before. But um, our focus really is about uh, inequity, but how from inequity we've been able to support and find some solutions to improve in all of these areas plus more. Uh, and, and not only that, but when you think about uh, you know, blended learning or personalized learning or any other innovation um, in education, what you really want to make sure you do is, is try to think about why it is that we're using these, these methodologies to help us in, improve education. And not just because it's blended learning and it, it's because it's using technology. Um, this is the other reason why we exist. You see that they are much older. One is 19 years old. He's been a blended learner since he was five. And his brother is also about to graduate. He was a blended learner since he was five. Uh, as a parent, um, and, and being in education, but as a parent first, I was told when they were five, getting ready to enter the public education space, that uh, they were gonna be bored that they, were needed, they needed acceleration whoops, excuse me, in math, reading, and writing, and that as a parent, I had to be aware of that. And so 
my role as a parent was to ensure that they were not going to be bored, uh, possibly a dropout, uh, you know, that uh, gifted and talented students have a tendency, if they're bored, to become dropouts or to not graduate from high school. And so rather than just trying to um, let the system support them in the ways that they could, and, and I believe in the public education system, I, they were always in public education, I, I, I needed to try to find other ways to support their learning. And so happens that it was in 2000, gosh, uh, let's see, no, I'm sorry, 2001, online education was just starting to make its way into the K-12 education space. So around that time, I was able to find some resources in online ed and, and, and just say, okay, well, maybe I can do some supplemental at home while they get their, their traditional education in the classroom. And so thus was the start of online education. And so through the years, uh, I worked in districts, kind of helping my, my kids, but also I worked in online schools when they first started. Um, in Colorado, one of the first online schools uh, was um, in two, built in 2001, or created in 2001, and that's kind of when I started into that space. So half my career, I came from a traditional classroom setting, and then the other half of the, my career, I was really in the e-learning kind of innovation space. When I went to uh, Jeffco Public Schools, it's the largest district in Colorado, about 85,000 students, I came in as the director of e-learning. But I, I soon found out what my role really was there. It was as a consultant. And my job was to change the mindset of 130 principals and 5,000 teachers and um, build a program to implement something called online education, which eventually evolved into blended learning. And we needed to implement that in every school in the district. So it was a pretty tall order, um, but the good news was that I was excited to do it because I saw results with my own two children, and I saw results across the nation as I was doing some research and visiting other schools who were kind of starting in that space. The focus of, of the purpose of this was to provide equity and access in the district, even though that wasn't what they were thinking at first. What they really wanted to do was bring the kids back who were going to other online schools outside of our district and we wanted to, to keep them um, in our district, but then offer them uh, you know, all of the options that they would have outside our district. And so access to online courses, or let's say uh, a student needed French 3 and they couldn't get it in our district, we needed to be able to provide that. So I was really a consultant for the district. I had met with every single principal. I attended every principal meeting. I uh, worked with every department in, within the district. I worked with the school board, the community, the superintendent, so I was basically consulting. Um, and then I was also having to figure out how are we going to train all of our teachers to move into this new way of thinking about um, instruction. We had to create our own digital content because if you can imagine outfitting 85,000 students with uh, accounts from, let's say, a, a content provider, would have we would never be able to afford that. It would be in the millions. And so, and I had to figure out a way how to make that a cost savings to the district. How are we going to implement something so grand and save money? <laughs> it's definitely a challenge, but it can be done. And uh, sorry for the graphic, but um, so through that work, I was there for about four years. We did successfully implement blended learning. Um, we also turned a uh, failing online school around to performance, which is the highest level of accreditation in our state. Um, and through blended learning, we were able to outfit every secondary level student, middle school and high school, with options to take blended learning courses, supplemental courses, or be in the traditional classroom. And with that, uh, went to the Colorado Department of Education, uh, worked with them, oh, excuse me, I need to time this so I don't go over my time, uh, and, uh, and, and, and helped uh, kind of have some conversation about how can we bring this to the state level so that every district can partake in something like this. The unfortunate thing about where I came from in Jeffco is that I had teams of people working with me. So we were able to develop our own content. We were able to uh, have a, a fully staffed online school with assistant principals. And I also had a staff in blended learning where we had people uh, directing different projects within, that, within um, our implementation. 
And so what we found in Colorado, and I see this across the nation now, is huge inequity. So for example, because we had 85,000 students, we had the best prices on um, from vendors. So we were able to get a learning management system for every student for like $2.50 a student. And if you just went to the next district, right bordering our district, they were being sold learning management system accounts for $10 a student. So huge discrepancy, huge inequity, and so what we're trying to do is close that gap. And we're also um, working with districts to make sure that they understand you can, you can um, afford this and um, you just have to have the knowledge base, you know, and a little bit of training and, and you'd be able to, to accomplish a, a successful implementation. So in Colorado, we have an initiative that uh, it was a law that just passed in May and it's called, and, and we named the initiative the Colorado Empowered Learning Initiative. And what, what uh, this initiative does is it brings all of what you saw, the services that, that we worked on in our district, and we bring that now to every district in Colorado. So for example, if, if you're in the southeastmost corner of Colorado, you're not gonna have a director maybe of e-learning, you're not gonna have a, a content team, a content building team, you know, you're not gonna have all of that. But what this initiative allows us to do is bring in the troops or bring in the resources and the training so that they can be outfitted with a team basically that's subsidized by the state. And so now that's going to help other districts who want to implement blended learning but maybe didn't have the resources to allow them to move forward and do that. We, uh, we created this, um, this uh, project based on what we saw what was happening in North Carolina. In North Carolina, they have an organized effort by the state basically to work with every district in the state to help them implement blended learning models in every school. So we're, we're attempting to do the same thing in Colorado. We're just a little bit behind it. We don't have the, the budget for all of this, but that's how uh, what, what the state of Colorado has done was had uh, nonprofit organizations working together in collaboration to then provide services as a whole. Um, and so the goals of the Colorado Empowered Learning Initiative it really is so that all students have access. All students have access to trained teachers who understand the blended learning models, when and uh, which ones to use and how to use them. They need to have access to courses that they normally maybe not have in their, in their districts. Uh, we have some districts who couldn't even offer Algebra II uh, because they just didn't have the staff, you know, a district of maybe 50 students and they can't staff enough to, to offer them Algebra II. Uh, the resources. How can teachers use technology or how can districts afford, let's say, all of the hardware that would be required to really fully implement blended learning at scale uh, and, 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 and still not break the bank? So we can bring in affordable, uh, affordable resources and quality to support these programs in full. And then finally, sustainability. The last thing you want is to implement uh, the, what, what we call them unfunded mandates or unfunded uh, projects that are delivered by the departments of ed saying, well, you need to do this or you really should be doing this. And there's no money for that. I've uh, been there, done that. Uh, a goal, uh, really, the, the bottom line in order to ensure that all students have access all the time is that you have a sustainable program. So you need to build capacity internally. And for all the resources that you use, uh, if, they're, if they're low cost or free, that's going to be the most effective. And uh, you wanna make sure that they're all quality. I think I said that. Uh, so, focusing on blended learning. Uh, and and so, so that's kind of setting the stage of, of things to think about when you're interested in moving in this direction. Again, you could be talking about personalized learning and that's what you want for your, your school or your district or your classroom, but blended learning, remember, is a means to get there. Uh, so uh, when you're thinking about blended learning specifically, here are all the main areas that uh, you need to be kind of thinking about beforehand and then more. This is just kind of a, a, a very general overview of that. And at the top, you'll see there's planning and policy. Usually planning comes before the policy because as you plan, you'll see that policy may need to change or some policies get in the way and, 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 and you're moving forward with the implementation. 
For the sake of today's uh, session, we're just going to focus on three areas, leadership, teacher training, and then content. Uh, and, and that really is going to be the focus of the remainder of this session. So uh, starting with leadership, uh, I can't tell you how important this is. Without the right leadership in place, you're not going to have a successful program. We've worked with plenty of districts who have um, identified the leader as um, this person who works in X high school, this person likes technology, they've been using a free platform called Moodle, let's say. And that person's going to become our TOSA or our part-time blended learning coordinator, director, whatever title they chose. That happens more often than you think, and it's not just with small districts. Uh, you need to ensure that when you are truly thinking about who's going to lead the, and I say who, you need a point of contact or at least a team. Uh, you need someone who's going to understand what that means and have the time to coordinate with all of the groups, all of the stakeholders, all of the vendors, I mean every single component in really pushing an initiative forward um, that has the skills and the time to do that. So, um, you know, the communication with all the different departments, that includes the board of education in your district, your community, Parents are going to want to know what the heck's going on. So, you know, when, when you're identifying who is going to be your champion for the work, uh, please ensure that, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking very carefully about who that person is. Now, it still could be, uh, you know, the teacher in X school who likes technology and happens to have used a platform for years, but make sure that they understand that, that they get the support that they need, the training that they need, if you need to bring an outside resource, uh, like a consultant, they can work with that person side by side, uh, you know, but, but ensure that, that this person is getting the, the help and the support that they need to, to really truly move this forward um, in a successful manner. Um, and then also uh, making sure that all the departments and all the different areas in the school or the school district are, are, are being um, a part of the conversation. You know, everyone's talking about, you know, what, where are we with the budget and what does that mean? Um, what is the strategy? How are we going to approach this? Are we going to do a full wide implementation all at once or are we going to work, you know, on pilots and, and do like a three to five year strategy? Anymore, it's more like three years. Uh, the training, who's going to take care of training? This is something that to um, consider on the professional development. When you're working with vendors, let's say, and let's say that you've, you've, defied, you've decided you want this content vendor to provide you with the digital content, they're going to tell you, oh, we're going to provide you with PD, we're going to train your teachers, we're going to train all your staff, you'll be fine, and you need to pay this amount for that extra training, but we're going to train you. Always keep in mind that when they're offering training, it's about their product, their service, it's specialized for what they can offer for your districts or your teachers that you yourselves are going to use it the way it was designed. Is it really about shifting the mindset of instruction? Is it really about blended learning, like when to use different models, how to use them, and what's the best for the different students in different classes for different subjects? Keep that in mind. That that's one area in which uh, I, I uh, when I'm I'm working with districts or at least even working with colleagues and they're talking about well this comes with its PD and it's an extra twelve thousand dollars but then they're going to train everyone and do this always keep in mind that when you're working with a vendor it's because they need you to use their product and not only that but they're going to leave you wanting more so that is something that that has been very tricky when it comes to professional development you'll see that a lot oh we can provide PD but Make sure it's not just focused on what they offer, but it's really truly about instruction and education and supporting teachers and, 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 and students. And then of course hardware. Hardware is not just about laptops anymore. Um, you know, anymore if you're, if you're implementing and using technology in the classroom, students should be using these. You know, um, I know that there's lots of policies and, and, and out there where teachers are saying, 
check these at the box, put them in the box when you come into class. I mean, my son still goes into classrooms where they say, put this away, you're not going to use your phones, and we're going to do the sit and get. Um, I don't go into the classroom, I don't interrupt that, but what I, what I do see is kind of like a, a this is a, a valuable asset, it's a great tool, and if used correctly, the teachers can leverage this for, for teaching and learning. And not only that, but that breaks down the walls to their classroom. It opens up the flexibility. It opens up the ability for students to now not use their phones you know, for texting, and I know that still happens and so on, but with true engagement and, and really um, uh, effectively using a classroom with certain blended learning models, they're going to be using this all the time for research, for working on projects, especially project-based learning, with applications that are used for instruction um, that engages them and connects them with others. So uh, again, you know, it's not just about the laptop anymore, it's really about which mobile device or which device is best suited for the classroom and how will that be used. So again, this is another professional development thing. You'll find that um, with different hardware vendors, they're also going to provide professional development for you to use the device or for the students to use the devices. What you really want is PD on how instruction can, how that, how that device can help with the instruction in the most effective way. Any questions so far? Any, anyone who has been in this situation or this sounds familiar or you kind of, you've run into some of these barriers or questions? Just want to make sure I'm not preaching to the choir that I'm really trying to offer something that that is helpful okay uh, all right so training and development we'll, we'll go into now professional development uh, how many of you have taken professional development even online or face-to-face -face, where uh, it's talking um, you're learning more about philosophy the philosophy of blended or innovation it's kind of academic that you can't really apply in your classroom immediately or in, in your role immediately. Okay. Uh, how, and, and, and I, I know the answer to this, but I will see where you are. How many of you have taken professional development where you've walked away and you're just like, that was kind of a waste of time? More hands, okay. So uh, what, what we want to make sure um, when we're saying, hey, we're going to offer professional development again is we're going to think about how that's delivered. Is it delivered where in your district or in your school you have four days of PD for the year? And that may mean like uh, an after, a Friday afternoon where you're all sitting together in a room and you're, you're receiving PD and then you walk away and that's what you have to use for your classroom for the next month or whatever until the next PD day. Um, I mean, that still works in some cases or in many cases, but is that truly accessible so that a teacher or an educator can get what they need when they need it and then use it in their classrooms? Uh, when um, you're thinking about creating a, a PD uh, program, especially for you know implementing something new or something very different, you want to make sure that it's accessible whenever, however. So 24-7 is, is on demand. Uh, is your professional development program something that a teacher can tap into when they're at home and they, 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 they can do maybe like some PD for 30 minutes or an hour and they can access that immediately? And with facilitators that are there to support them through communication channels within the training. Is it relevant? Is it something that um, an educator needs in their classroom for the next day. I need to do this, how can I do this, or how can I apply this in my classroom so it's relevant to, you know, not just my, um, my algebra class, but also my geometry class and also my algebra two class. And then practical, is it solid quality practice? Is it something that uh, the teacher is going to be able to uh, apply immediately? Uh, practical application is super important. I know that there are MOOCs out there, so free online teacher training or educator training courses that are six, eight, 12 weeks long, and by the end of that, then you're gonna know all about blended learning and 
things are going to be great. I can't tell you how many teachers I've spoken with who said, yeah, we tried a MOOC, but I dropped out after two weeks because they were expecting all of this. And in the end, I didn't really, I wasn't learning a whole lot. Or it was taking so much of my time, and it was all based on philosophy that I really couldn't use it in my classroom. And that's, those are the types of situations you want to avoid because you know, it's, it's not going to do anything for really moving forward with innovation. If anything, it's going to shut people down and say, this is not really what I'm looking to do. So in, in uh, Jeffco, in the district where I uh, was working, and this is where I see a lot of districts moving to, is online professional de uh, development training that's on demand, offered all the time, year round, and offered with college credits that are associated with that, and professional development hours. So um, in, in, um, in Jeffco, what we were able to do was create an online teacher training program. And this was for school principals and district leadership as well. Our superintendent went through some of the training courses herself. And, and, and what we found was we did a pilot with just two or three courses to see, well, who's going to try this out? Let's offer it out there and see what we get. What we ended up doing was with those three courses, they filled immediately. We only had 25 slots that we, we had planned for each of those courses, and then we ended up with a waiting list. So the next semester, we opened it up even more. We kept filling classes, and through lots of trial and error over three years, uh, we were able to find kind of a formula that worked. Professional development online classes that were no longer than three weeks long, three to four weeks, that was kind of the breaking point in which people would, um, they would uh, enroll in the courses, complete them, the, the completion rates were higher, and not only that, but um, the uh, participation rates were higher. Anything beyond about four weeks, when you got into six, eight, 12 weeks, the completion uh, rates and the participation rates really kind of went downhill. So we didn't want to waste time and money, so we started to create professional development that was hitting around that mark. Uh, we trained over 3,000 teachers in the first two to three years, and then after that, every teacher was participating in online teacher training, um, which was also blended. So we did blended courses in which we would meet face-to-face -face, um, at the beginning, middle, and end of the courses. And then um, we, the, the goal here for blended learning was that the teacher experience needed to be the same or similar to a student who was going through blended learning courses. And same with personalized learning. Um, we wanted anyone who was part of, of, uh, of this initiative, especially at the beginning, to really understand what that looked like, what it felt like. We also created courses that were aligned with national standards. Uh, we work, uh, and, and currently with the nonprofit, we work with INACAL, they're one of our partners. Uh, we also work with the SREB and uh, the Clayton Christensen Institute. Uh, we actually, uh, we follow Michael Horn very closely. Uh, we've participated in a lot of their research and so on, but aligning with the, the quality standards was very important. And the reason being is because you want to make sure that when you are implementing or talking about blended learning that everyone is talking about the same thing. So we've heard terms such as hybrid, uh, the supplemental, um, different terms about what that means, flipped classroom. When you are, are, are um, making sure that we are, are speaking the same language, you, you really do need to make sure that, that you're referencing, whoops, the national, national conversation or the national communications. So for that, uh, we, we wanted to make sure that when you're talking about a rotation model that everyone's on the same page. Or a flex model. Does anyone know what flex models are? Or what's an example of a flex model? So you've heard of the flipped classroom? That's a flex model. Uh, that's not a model of blended itself, but it does fit in the category of flex. Flex models are where you have a, a teacher offering the instruction in a classroom, however that looks, and then part of the time, students are accessing instruction from home, from wherever, outside of the walls of the classroom. And you could have a, stu a, a classroom where a teacher is, is instructing two days a week, 
The rest of the days, the students in, in the high school, they're off, they're doing their own thing, and they're accessing instruction whenever and wherever they want. And then they meet two days a week with the teachers as a classroom whole, and they have these discussions, or they do these, these other activities. Students who need the extra help face-to-face, -face, they come in in the other days, and the teacher is able to offer small group to one-on-one -on -one instruction for these kids who need extra help. That's an example of a flex model, and there are many schools that are offering flex models. Uh, Self-blend is more like a supplemental. Um, in, in this spectrum here, what you see is that uh, the full-time online program is an online school where students don't go to a classroom, they get full, full online instruction. For me, in my opinion, that's about less than 5% of the student population who needs something like that. But as you go clockwise, you move into kind of the, 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 um, the spectrum of rotation where there's some blended learning models happening in elementary. There might be students who are going from station to station or within a middle school for students who need access to um, technology and instruction. They may go into a computer lab or a library. Um, and, to, and then as you go around um, to enriched virtual, uh, you have your flex, self-blend. Enriched virtual are those um, online schools, usually district-run or district-led online schools who are now moving towards a blended learning model. So they still have students who are doing uh, or getting their instruction online, but they may be coming in two or three days a week or meeting with teachers daily part of the time to get uh, that face-to-face -face component. And so to go in a little bit more on, I'm um, sorry about the, that's not looking so good. If you can't read that, uh, we have the different models of blended learning, starting with the tech-rich courses. Tech-rich just means that a teacher is utilizing technology in the classroom. There might be like a writing app that they're using for students. And so when they're doing some, some work, they're, they're using this app for some writing practice. Uh, and then um, as I go through these, these are the different variations of blended learning as you're going from like just tipping or uh, dipping your toes in, 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 in some of the blended learning uh, methodology, uh, rotation. Here's an example of where, um, uh, I'm sorry, that's not a rotation. <laughs> I apologize. A rotation would be where the students are in the classroom or on site and then they are, they're moving around to different stations and getting different, um, different methods of instruction offered to them. So there could be a teacher uh, working in a small group with students while others are using their, their laptops or their, um, their mobile devices. And then they could be um, individual one uh, where students are doing research on their own working um, independently. So that's an example of a rotation model. And then the flex model is where, uh, again, teachers offer the online, on-site support as needed. Um, you'll see this in credit recovery a lot. Uh, that's where a lot of districts will start with uh, some of the flex models as well. And I'll just kind of go through here um, so you can see all of the different models. Uh, Self-blend might be where a lot of districts start. I see uh, uh, this is based out of need. So if a district, let's say, needs um, some help with higher level or, or different levels of foreign language. We need the Chinese, Chinese uh, courses. Then they may go to online Chinese courses and offer that through their district, and that's a supplemental or self-blend model. So there's a lot of online learning that's taking place based on need, and, and, and usually it's one, two, or maybe three courses at the most. That's usually offered at any level, even at the elementary school, um, because with students who may be uh, in a hospital or they may be traveling a lot, they'll do some supplemental education um, at the elementary school too. So, uh, you know, when you're starting with Tech Rich and you're going um, kind of full circle into the full virtual, you know, online school, you'll see that the spectrum or the variation of blended learning is, is quite a bit. I mean, there, there are different levels of blended learning. They're all, I mean, it, our goal is not that we're going to get to the self-blend and we're going to be good. It's that all of these can be applied in most classrooms. It depends on the needs of the students, the age of the students, and the ability for the students to be flexible. So for example, you would not likely use a self-blend model in an elementary school. You know, a self-blend where a student, or a flex model where students can, you know, go to class twice and then the, the other um, three days in the week they're, they're out doing other things. 
obviously not appropriate for a, an elementary school. But in the training that you'll, you'll have um, access to, it's going to go deeper into these models and when it might be appropriate for you. But you as the teacher, you as the educator, you have the, uh, um, the autonomy to decide what's going to be best in your classroom. And then finally, content. Uh, content is, is, I mean, we could do a whole workshop on content. Um, but what I wanted to convey is that you're going to have vendors that, uh, that come to you and say, you need our content because of this, or we are adaptable, or we are scalable, or you know, we can offer all the whiz bang stuff with the graphics and the animation and all of that for this price. And what you'll find is it's usually really expensive. Um, to scale that can be difficult, but it can be done. Um, and, and when you're making decisions on, on content, one thing that you'll want to keep in mind is, do you really need a full content provider uh, like a, a fuel ed or an ingenuity? Or can you um, use a supplemental provider such as I, I Ready for math um, or different programs uh, for, for writing and so on? Can you put together a program where you use some supplemental content and it's not just a 100% content provider? And then also, are you in a position where you have teachers that can be trained how to write quality content and then you can create your own repository of courses? And in Jeffco and in other districts where we've worked now, we felt that we could do the same or we could do better. And that was based on using content providers for years. So in Jeffco, as a result, what we were able to do was we put together a course development team. These were teachers who we paid to uh, be trained to create content or courses for the district. In the end, we created over 55 student online courses and we saved thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, if, if you're at all um, involved in or are familiar with open education resources, there is, uh, and I'm hoping that they share this, this PowerPoint presentation with everyone because this link will show you how this kind of can get started with teachers. It's really out of grassroots. I've had so many teachers say, I have a great astronomy class. I want to put it online. I want to digitize it. Can we, can we use your platform and just so I can create the online class? And then I can use it for blended learning in my own classroom. Yes, absolutely. And there's more and more teachers that are doing this over and over again. And so hopefully you'll have that resource um, from this uh, presentation. But you know what, what we found is that teachers were already putting worksheets and documents online in some platform, Google Classroom even, so that they could share that out with their students and make it easier to access. But what we, what we learned from there is that teachers really wanted a nice lesson up there or, or a unit or even a whole class that was digitized that they then could manipulate, customize however they wanted to, when they wanted to, how they wanted to. And so what we were able to do is help them understand how you can create audio and visual and graphics and animation in your content so it can be even more engaging.
learn about all the different models of, of blended learning. It's going to provide you with research. It's going to connect you with Michael Horn's, um, uh, his research.